So last week, in the line of Mother's Day, I was thinking, and you know me, I sometimes like playing around with words. And uh, while doing some preps and, and just looking through some scriptures, I, I wanted to come out, and I hope it's in a honoring way, the mother of all sins. Like, what is, like sometimes, what is the taproot of sinful lifestyles? Where does it start from? Like a mother, she starts something and you have something poor out of that. You know, she's the source. She's the origin. And so I'm using that in a sense metaphorically, trying to refer to this and talking about a one word. And that word today, before I say it to you, I'm, I'm going to just give you a run up. Have you ever watched people take their pet to obedience classes and they teach them how to behave and how to sit and stand and when to yield and when to run and so on. Have you ever seen children that go to school so they learn disciplines, they learn routines? Because inside us and inside animals for that matter, we have a certain inclination and a leaning to do certain things. The scriptures say, put it this way, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is destruction. So we all have inherently in us, we have a leaning, we have a bias to want to go in a certain way. And that way, really, friends, is a way away from God. It, it leans away from God, never to God, but away from God. That's the natural sinful, Adamic nature that we all have running through our veins. Our father, forefather, Adam sinned, and in all of us, we have sin running in us. So there's, a, there's an inclination to lean towards that. In the same vein, I have never seen, and you've heard me say this before, I've never seen um, somebody having to teach their child how to be naughty. But it's inherent in a child to want to be naughty. We have to teach them how to be good. So the bottom line here, the word that I want to leave with you, if you can find me that scripture, please, and we'll just put it up. There's a story behind this verse, but some of you may know the story. This is the tail end of a very, very uh, sad story, actually. It's about Saul, King Saul, who uh, was given an instruction by God to destroy all the Amalekites and their cattle and basically exterminate them, annihilate, take them all out, clean them out. I don't want to see them around. But he went, he destroyed some, then he took certain chosen cattle and animals and he spared the king and he comes up to God and he's basically like, say, I'm going to keep this. So when, when the prophet Samuel comes to visit him, Samuel says, Saul... What is this, the bleating of sheep that I hear? And Saul comes out with this very impressive res response. And he says, uh, Samuel, uh, what I've done is, you know, all the nice cattle, I've kept them so I can offer them to God as a sacrifice. You see, when God says, and he gives you an instruction, and he says, I want you to destroy all those things. Then you come later and you tell God, I've destroyed 75% of it, but there's a 25% I've kept. You know, it looks so pretty, it looks so nice. Can I keep it? Because I'm actually going to use it for your glory. How do we take something that God said, get rid of, and try to present it to God as an offering? And the bottom line here, this is where Samuel comes with his punchline. Samuel replied to him, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than to sacrifice. And to heed, that means pay attention, is better than the fat of rams. Now, this is a very popular scripture, to obey is better than to sacrifice. The word that I want to leave with us today is the word obedience. 
the word obedience. Now, I want to take you back. You can take that scripture off. Thank you. I want to take you back in time into two gardens. Two gardens. One is the Garden of Eden, where all of humanity was cradled and was born and birthed. Then secondly, I want to take you to another garden. In the time of Jesus, it's called the Garden of Gethsemane. Adam was our ancestral forefather. And in that same place, God said to him, Adam, here's this beautiful garden. You call it paradise. It's the Garden of Eden. I want you to enjoy all these things that I've got for you, Adam. But Adam, everything but this one thing. Do not touch this. Do not touch this tree. Do not partake of this. Because the day you do, you will surely die. Now, Adam, born perfect, God cre was God's apex creation. Of course, the wife came on later. She was taken out of Adam. But in Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, of course, there comes the hissing serpent. You know what's the first thing the devil always does to every one of us? His trick has not changed. The Bible says, do Become wise. In your own understanding, be wise. Be crafty. Be understanding. Be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Remember, the devil's got only old tricks. Nothing new. And he, one of his chief tricks that he uses is the, is the trick of subtlety. He's subtle. He's very subtle. He slips into your life so subtly you'll never even know it. And so he comes along there and he says to Adam and Eve, actually, he actually has a conversation with the lady. If you read it very carefully. Did God really say, you shall not eat of this? Whenever doubt is thrown in about the authority of God's word, doubt creeps in, all of a sudden it seems like, hey, this is actually negotiable. Actually, I'm not sure if God really meant that. And then what we do is we take God's absolute instruction and we water it down to something that's, whether it's suitable to you, palatable to you, whether it's usable to you. And you find people find themselves in this place. It's the same thing that's happening in the world today. I'll tell you one of the key things that's going on in the world today in this very intelligent, uh, very up there, technologically advanced age. One of the chief things that you will hear around in universities and so on is the Bible really God's word? What is, the, what is the question? Same question there was in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say that? The scriptures are coming under serious scrutiny. People come out with language like, there are no absolutes. It's only relevant truth. Relevant to where you're at, from your position, from your perspective in life, it's relevant. You know, what's good for you might not necessarily be good for me. It's, it's debatable. People play with that. The same story from the Garden of Eden is the same one that's today. Now, friends, what I'm saying to you, the same old devil, same almighty God, and the struggle continues. So yes, in this garden, perfect Adam. Remember, he had no sin because the, the Lord said to him, Adam, the day you eat of this, you shall die. Sin will come into you. So he was sinless. And while he was there, of course, through Eve and the serpent conversation, we find that he slipped down into a place of disobedience. There's that word again, disobey. You see, friends, the bottom line, if you want to describe what is sin, sin is when we go against God's instruction. If it says the robot's red, you don't drive through, you find everyone goes through. Friend, in our society today, you look around you, you will find most places, you'll even hear some people say, I hope you haven't said this. Hey, rules are meant to be broken, man. That is actually, I hope I'm not too strong. That's actually not from God's kingdom, that kind of statement. You know, rules are meant to be broken. So I take my vows. I make a promise. Promises are meant to be broken. It's, you put that line into you. You start to think like that. You start to give allowances that 
if I've made a promise like to your friend, as a gentleman to a gentleman, I promise you, my friend, I'll come and see you next week. And you don't. Rather not promise then. Don't say rules are made, you know, promises are made, can be broken. We do fail. I know we all fail in that area from time to time. But let me get back again to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, we know the story. They sinned. Why? Because they disobeyed God's instruction. Even if it is a beautiful hissing serpent that's looking to say very, very interesting academic little gymnastics that's going on, trying to disprove the authenticity of God's instruction and tell you and dissuade you from going God's way and shows you that this is the way that you can go. Actually, it's not only one way. There's a couple of ways you can go and do this thing. For me, it's God's way. All the way. All the way, friends. And I, I know sometimes that sounds claustrophobic. It sounds like, hey, Anthony, how can you be so like narrow-minded? I'll tell you this much. When you get to understand God, you will know He's got a huge, generous, extravagant heart for you to have the best life. It's not a narrow-minded thing from a very, very tyrannical God up there who wants to keep you subservient and a slave to His orthodox ways. No. That's not the God we're talking about. This, this God is not a tyrant. He's a loving father. And any of you that got children, you know, my boy, I don't want you to go there, my boy. Please. Oh, dad. Oh, you know, and then you go and do it and you get hurt. And the father's heart pains more because it doesn't want his child to get hurt. It's not done because it, doesn't want, it wants to reduce you to nothing. It's done, it's done because it wants to spare you. It wants to save you. I hope you got that. All good so far. Here's the Garden of Eden. The first Adam. And he succumbs to that. And they disobey. They partake of the forbidden fruit. And it says from that day onwards, man walked in disobedience. And all of humanity plummeted into this dark dungeon, you know, of sin and of doing wrong. And all of us Inherently, we are, we are sinners by nature. Romans 3.23 says it so clearly. All have sinned. And all of us have fallen short of God's glory, God's standard. we all beneath. But it's only through Jesus that the change comes. I want to take you to the second garden. The second garden was the garden of Gethsemane. In that garden, in the New Testament, we read it's Jesus. And it's before his crucifixion time. And here's Jesus, who in the scriptures he's called the second Adam. Why was he called the second Adam? Because he's the only other human being that was born without sin. Jesus, like Adam, the first Adam, he being the second Adam, was perfect, sinless. He was born without a natural father, miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit through a conduit, surrogate mother in Mary. And Jesus was born. When Jesus was born, he was perfect. And there came a time, crunch time. God sent him on a mission. Son, God so loved the world, he gave his son. Whoever believes on him should not perish. He was here on a mission. And Jesus, when the time came to a head, when he realized, it's that time now, where that thing that God gave me to do, Father gave me this instruction that I ought to do this, it's come to a head. What was it? It was to die on the cross, a horrible death, not just physically, but in his soul, even in his spirit. Jesus suffered in, in three ways. It wasn't just the physical nails and so on. There were many other things. I've shared that at the Easter time. I'm not going to go there for now. But when you think about all that, Jesus saw that coming up. He saw the blackness of sin having to be placed upon a perfect one who had done nothing wrong. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know the story, Jesus knelt and he prayed with such fervor unto God. He says, Father, is there no other way? In fact, it was so intense. It says that his sweat transformed into droplets of blood. This was deep, in, in, you know, it's unexplainable agony. And Jesus was agonizing about this thing, about should he do this? Can he afford to? Can he make it? 
Who, is there no other way? But there was actually no other way. Heaven was silent. There was no plan B. This was the plan. And in that agony, friends, Jesus broke the back of sin by saying, Father, not my will. Look at that. Not what I want, but what you want. And so the second Adam, he broke the back of this horrible curse that hangs over all mankind. That's where he started his whole process of delivering us from sin. Jesus said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And then he submitted himself, he yielded himself to be taken, and then finally to be crucified, because Jesus, the second Adam, never failed. The first Adam failed, and all of us fell into sin. The second Adam came, and he delivered us. He came as our deliverer, leader, our savior, to set us free from this life of disobedience to God's plan. All good so far. When you look at that, friends, today, this thing about disobedience, this thing about disobedience is huge. I have a sense in my heart, and allow me just to speak freely, I have a sense in my heart that the devil don't mind how many people attend church. You can have churches with thousands and multiple thousands of people, but as long as they go there, clap their hands, sing, and walk out, and don't do what the Scripture says. They can carry on. The only people who are a threat to the kingdom of darkness, who are God's secret arsonary against the kingdom of the devil, are those people who will see what the Word says, make adjustments, adjust our life to fit God's plan, because as I told you earlier, He's a loving Father. He only has, like Proverbs, like, um, oh, let's leave Proverbs out, like God's good plan. When I think about it, it's, it's, God only wants us as a people to be prosperous, to be blessed. You know, Proverbs is a book of wisdom. It tells you things. And God is, is the author of all wisdom. I'm telling you today, precious people, so many of us sometimes want to stand up and almost square up with God and say, hey God, you know what? This is a modern age now, God. The Bible was written a long time ago. It doesn't fit into today's world. I'm telling you this much. The Bible don't need no updating. The Bible does not need to be in any way updated, upgraded, like all our other technological devices and our syllabuses and education. God's Word is forever constant. And what He spoke then is still applicable today. And when applied in our life, friend, you're going to see amazing things happen. I, uh, I feel in my heart of hearts, God wants all of us as a people to be a blessed people. To be a blessed people. I want to take you in for a small journey into the thing about obedience. And you'll be amazed where I'm going to land it on in the next few minutes. I'm going to land it on, on a subject that can be sometimes a bit sensitive. We don't talk about it all the time, but every now and again I think it's necessary for us to just talk about it. Jesus said, you, I, you can't serve two masters. Anyone remember that? You can't serve two masters. What were the two masters? What were the two different masters? Anyone knows? You can't serve God or... Hello? Mammon. It doesn't even say the devil. You can't serve God or the devil. It doesn't even put the devil there. God or mammon. That word mammon speaks about Money, about monetary exchange, about how we do business in life. Do you know something, friends? The seat of most things that go wrong in our world, look at politics, look at business, how people transact, is greed. I hope I'm making sense. The, the, the thing that really gets to us is this thing about greed. Do you know greed is a very, very subtle thing. And when people get and they see more, their eyes pop up and they want more. When that spirit gets you, you're in trouble. Somebody put a funny post the other day. 
and they had this two slices of bread. And in between there was a huge chunk of bologna. And they said, when I eat the jackpot, nobody will know, but maybe my sandwiches will give me away. It's just a funny thing. I just want to lighten you up a bit. I'm too intense here. But the thing about greed is a huge thing. It's, it's, it's a huge thing. I've got so many messages we can talk and we can actually sit and explore together, to learn together. We are all on a journey. I, I, I want to submit that to us. We're all on a journey and we have to help each other. We've got to learn to encourage each other. Not to speak condescendingly on people or speak down to people, but encourage each other. Pick each other up so that we all run the best race we can. We all must do well. We hit the tape and the finish there. We must all do it well. All of you must do well in God because that's why Jesus came. He wanted you to do well. He wanted you to have the best life in Him. And so sometimes we, we sometimes think, and it's obviously influenced by another dark kingdom that tells you God actually, God actually don't, don't like you. God wants to take all your toys out. God wants you to live a boring, dull, miserable life so that when you die, you look like lemon, you know. That's, that's not what God wants. He wants you to live life with a capital letter L. He said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I remember those days when I was at work that time and I uh, get to work on Monday morning and uh, some of the guys got bandages and stuff like that. Said, yeah, how was the weekend, bro? Hey, we had a, hey, we had a like a time, man. Said, and what was the bandages? Ah, well, you know how it goes. Waiting for next week, we got another one to go to. I said, Anthony, how was your weekend? Oh, you must be went to church. So I had a boring weekend. You know the tone that's coming across. Shame, poor you. You had to go sit in church, poor chap. We had a, hey, we had a lucky time. This weekend, we're looking for another one. I want to encourage you. God has the best plan for you. I'm, I'm, I'm standing here before you and telling you I love it. I, wanna, I want to really encourage you. This thing about walking in obedience to God, when it comes to the two gods, I spoke of the two gardens. I'm speaking about the two gods now. But don't, you can't serve two masters, two gods. You've got to love one and hate the other. And this is where it's at. Jesus taught us the best way to break the spirit of greed is to make sure that you, when you become God's child, you don't only give your heart to Jesus. You give him your business. You give him your wallet. You give him your plans. You give him the things you, your dreams about, you know, things you're dreaming about. You give it to God. Many of us only give God our heart. So for Sunday morning, you'll check our heart up. Okay, fine, carry on. But the rest of your life belongs to you. A truly submitted child of God gives everything to God. And that's what I want to leave you with this morning. When we submit our life to the Lordship of Jesus. Many of us like him as a savior. Oh, Jesus is our savior. He's going to take us to heaven. I mean, that's all true. That's why he came. But Jesus is not only our savior, my friends. Jesus wants to be Lord. Lord means he's the owner. He's the master of your life. I know it's an uncomfortable word, and especially when you don't know God and you haven't got to acquaint yourself. You don't understand his plan for you. You'll start to wonder, how can I entrust everything to somebody I don't know? Well, that's why I shared on Tuesday night here at the prayer meeting, Revelation 3.20 says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you would open the door, I'll come in and sup with you and you with me. Jesus, there in Revelation 3.20, while that scripture is used a lot for people that are unchurched, maybe there's an assumption that this is for unchurched people, it was actually written to the seven churches. And this was one of the churches that it was directed to, to say, Jesus talking to his church, to his people. Do you know how many church people don't have fellowship with Jesus? We go to church, and that's great, I'm a church boy. I'm delighted to see you in church too. 
But I have to speak the truth. I have to encourage you about where it is we're supposed to be heading to. The best thing you can do is to walk and live your life in relationship with Jesus. Let him, you know, when you sit at a dinner table and you have a meal together, you can't sit quiet. You have to talk to each other. You've got to engage each other. And that's what it's about. And when you get acquainted with Jesus, you will realize he's an awesome Lord that you will be willing to surrender to. He's an awesome Lord. So, one of the things that people struggle with when it comes to generosity is your giving to God. And <clears throat> I, I had somebody that basically kind of reprimanded me one time many months ago in the time of COVID when I sent out messages, if any of you would want to sow to the church because we're not meeting in the building, here's the church bank account. I got a message back same time. After hundreds of messages before that for all sorts of other things, if you know me, you know you'll never hear from this pulpit. Uh, make sure you give your love gift so that God can heal you. You watch TV, you watch how people do it. And it's not, I don't think it's pleasing to God's heart. But that's our view. We're not here to knock anyone, but you must be a discerner of it. If you put your $100 in the envelope now, we will pray over your request, you will get your healing. We don't work like that. This church doesn't work like we never have. And we don't go on about money. But you need to know some things about what's God's stand about money. We have to have some idea. We can't just be quiet about it and not talk about it. We have to talk about it every now and again. And we try to talk about it once or twice a year. We don't talk about it all the time. So my closing moments today, I want to talk to you just in closing about this thing about generosity. You see, friends, when you're a child of God, whatever you have, we believe, according to the scriptures, we don't own. We are merely stewards. We are stewards of God's resources. Therefore, if I'm a steward of something, that means I'm not an owner. And then if I'm not an owner, I'm accountable to someone. But when you feel you're the end, end boy on the block, you are the end. It ends in you. Then you are an owner. You don't have to explain anything to anyone. But when you are a steward, you realize I'm accountable. So one of the ways of showing accountability is to God say, God, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. And, uh, you know, and, and you honor God in that way about what he's doing in your life. You, you and God are on a journey. And you are me merely, you want to be a responsible, of course, a responsible steward of what God's given you. One of the words that people don't even know how sometimes know how to pronounce, is it tides, is it tides, is it high tide, low tide? They talk about church tides. Oh, the pastor only, only worries us. I know one brother came and says, I love that pastor so much, but once he talk about tides, I left. Why is he asking us for money? I'd like to see you when you go to pick and pay and you've got your trolley there and you stand on it and say, ah, don't you like my face? And don't pay for it. Everything has to be paid for. There's things to be done. And God has ways of how he resources you, how he resources his kingdom, how he resources reaching the world with the gospel, God has ways of how he resources that. We don't have to figure out where the guys are spending all our tax money because you know, it's another big black deep hole. We don't know where everything's going. But the taxes are paid faithfully. But they have to be accountable to God for one day for what they do with the national tax um, wallet that they receive. Similarly in this church, whatever you guys sow here, under God, before God, we will have to be accountable as well. So here's the thing about the tithe quickly, and I'm going to leave you to your lunch or breakfast. If some of you never had breakfast yet. Here's the thing, just quickly. And this is seriously to only help you. Only to help you. Now, Malachi is the book that speaks about tithes, and then tithes have been mentioned from Abraham's time, so, and then, then the law came later. So some people say, it's tithes from the law, and now in the New Testament, no more under... Actually speaking, no. It is a principle God has put in the Word, same like you must have, you must walk in holiness. It's all these principles. It doesn't change because old covenant, now the new covenant, we must just be licentious. You just do whatever you want to do. No, God has standards of how we ought to live. 
So when you press through the barrier of the Old Testament wall, you get to Malachi. And if you read Malachi in essence, it's a very prophetic book. It talks about the end times. Being the end book in the Old Testament, it speaks about the end times. And in there, in chapter 3, he talks about bring all the tides into the storehouse. So it kind of is a bridge of the Old Testament. It's an it's a anchor leaning towards the New Testament, bridging them all together, and it's giving you an overarching bridge that crosses over and it transitions into the New Testament. The New Testament, we, we don't have time to go too much into this, but very quickly I want to leave you with a couple of quick thoughts and then I'm done. The word there is not pay your tithes. That's why I want us to just think about this. You don't pay your tithes. You pay your bills. But the Bible teaches you bring your tithes. Now you may say, Anthony, but you're being petty now. What's the difference between those two words? Well, pay is like you have a debt. Bring means... Tim, would you mind hold this for me for a minute? Tim's got that iPad of mine, right? If Tim gives that to me, like now, is he paying me with this? Or is he bringing it to me? Why? Because I'm the owner. You see, your tithe in your bank account is God's. When you tithe, all you're doing is, God, this which you gave me, it belongs to you. The Bible says the tithes is the Lord's. It says, bring it. That means God's not saying to you, can you please uh, try and pay me by certain date. No, no, no. God says, what you got there in the form of a tithe is mine. And when it it's a certain time of the month or whenever in the year, you bring it and come. You know what God's blessed you with? You bring that, th that thing, which actually belongs to God. So, then he says, if, you, if you're writing scriptures, if you're writing scripture, I'm going to give you, I'm going to do a hurried three-minute close, all right? Three minutes. There's one part of Malachi that says, test me, says the Lord. Now, do you know that's a mo one of the most difficult things to understand when God says, test me. Test me. Because when I look at scriptures, I'll give you one. It's found in Exodus chapter 17. It says, why do you put the Lord to test? In other words, anybody who dare test God is, is a dangerous thing to do. You never test God. Numbers chapter 14. It says, not one of the men who saw my glory and my miraculous signs are performed in Egypt and the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times. Not one of them will ever see the promised land because there's an oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Anybody who dare test, test God is something you are strongly urged never to do. I can go on. Psalm 78 because they put the Lord to test and they rebelled against the Most High. I can take you to Psalm 95. Do not harden your heart as in the day of Meribah as you did on the day of Massa in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me. They tested me and tried me. Don't do that. God's word is saying don't do that. I can go on. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus spoke to the devil. He says, do not put the Lord God to test. He tells the devil that. So throughout scriptures you find God is saying, don't test God, don't test God. But there's only one place where God says, I'm asking you to test me. Seems kind of out of character. There's a huge principle at stake. There's a huge principle. You know, when you walk as God's child and you say, God... The man of God is preaching this morning about walk in obedience. To disobey what you know is sin. And when you think about living a life of generosity and a life of honoring God, so it's better to obey than to sacrifice. Some of us give a sacrifice, like I put 10 rand in the offering. I was supposed to buy a cone ice cream, but I put it in church. I sacrificed my ice cream. I gave it to the church. You sacrifice, but are you obeying? 
What is the obedience? What is the, what is the instruction? Bring your tithe to the storehouse. But you made a sacrifice. You gave that 50 rands. those by hamburger with. You put it in church. I won't have a hamburger this week. But friends, one of the huge things is most of us get so heavily in debt. We owe this one. We owe that one. We owe that one. We owe this one. Trust God to get out of debt. And I know we all go through challenges. and COVID has taught us huge lessons. But trust God that you can slowly but surely by His grace seek advice, get help from people. How do I reduce debt? Because I want to be free in a place where I'm empowered so that I can get to be a blessing in God's kingdom. I leave you with that. We walk in obedience rather than sacrifice. You can fast and pray all week and ask God to do amazing things. But if you have not obeyed God in things, you shut the heaven. It's better to obey than to do sacrifices. Some of us will sacrifice. We'll fast all week. We'll pray all week. Those are sacrifices. And they're good. There's nothing wrong with them. But it's better to obey than to sacrifice. The Lord says, when you do what I ask you to do, I will open the heavens. The heavens got open in in Durban coastline. You saw what happened? But the heaven that God's talking about is not a heaven to destroy you, but a heaven to bless you, an open heaven to resource you. And then he says the second thing, I will rebuke the devourer. Do you know you don't have to fast and pray and bind the devil and bind Satan and bind him and bind him and bind him and bind him? No, you, you just obey God. You do what God says you must do. God says, I will bind. I will rebuke the devourer. God comes to fight for you. You've got God as your biggest assurance agent. Gives you incredible assurance. And so many of us are doing the praying and the binding. You ask yourself beneath the surface, are you doing the obeying? When the obeying is right, the other things fall in place. God comes through for you. Now you see, friends, test God. The Lord says, try me. So there's two things about try me. When you give, you don't wait. Let me see now. I gave my tithe. Let's see if somebody's going to give me a new car. I'm waiting. No, no, no. Don't live like that. You do what you do, and God will do what he can. Then the other one about try me or test me. Okay, try hold it back too and see what happens. You'll always be battling to come through. But start trusting, and you see how God can turn things around because he wants you to have the best life. It's better to obey than to sacrifice. Are we all good? I'm closing. I'm going to pray with you now. Remember people today, you are in a valley of indecision. For those of you that have never opened your heart to the Lordship of Jesus, I would love to encourage you. Maybe he's a foreigner to you, Jesus is a stranger to you. I want to encourage you. Open your hearts to the Lord. If you want to talk about this, we're happy to talk about it later. Give me a call. I'll make time to come see you. We'll talk about you and Jesus being in right relationship. God doesn't only just want your money and not, your, and not you as a person. And, and if you want to keep the money as well, you keep it because that's, that's your choice. How you treat God and how you do things, that's also fine. It's 100% fine. But I can assure you, today in this church, we are not struggling because there's some incredibly generous people who sow in this house. They've sown over the years. I said to my wife, when I talk about money, I must talk about when we're not battling for money. It mustn't look like I'm asking, I'm talking, I'm teaching, because shame, pastor, must he needs money to pay some bills. That's why he's reminding us. No, friends, I can assure you right now, we're not in that place. We're not sitting with a big bank balance. Oh, that's not another thing too as well. But we're comfortable. God's been so good to us. God has been incredibly good to us. I want to leave that with you with love in my heart. I want to encourage you so that you have your best life. You're wondering why you can't have breakthrough. Have you put God first? These are questions we have to ask ourselves. Let's put Jesus first. Make him the Lord of your life. And then walk in obedience to what he has for your life. And see what God does for you. God's not our servant. He's our Lord. And we submit to his Lordship. The Lord bless you. Gracious Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. The entrance of your word brings light. And I thank you for every single precious individual that's here. Lord, I also pray 
that you will help us as we listen to your word. Help us not only to listen, but to see how we can align our life according to the way you want us to live. We want to be an obedient community of God-fearing people. Bless each precious person today. I pray, Father, that you'll forgive us wherever we have failed you, in areas where we have not fully obeyed and walked the way you want us. Thank you that your forgiveness is extended to us today. Thank you that if our hearts are open and we repent, that you can forgive, you can restore us. And so I thank you for that that's happening right now. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray that you will work that in all our lives. And Father, even as we journey on through this day and into the week ahead, I thank you for healing over all your people. I thank you for divine immunity. Keep us safe. Keep us, O oh God, out of harm's way. And help us, Lord God, as we journey on that through our lives, many people will come to know the love of Jesus. Father, take us safely as we go. And may your peace and your blessings go with each of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.